Now you may have noticed that I have a little scruff on my face after I got back from my trip. And I just want, to know, I just want you to know that it's because I, I don't have a problem listening to people in authority. As I, that's why. Because, um, so I was going through security on my way out of the country. And so the, um, the TSA agent, she looks at my passport and she looks at me. She looks at my passport. She looks at me. Well, in my passport, I have a beard. And that, you know, right after I left, I didn't have a beard. I was clean shaven. Third time, she looks at the passport. She looks at me. And she says, grow the beard back. <laughs> so I'm working on it, you know? <laughs> I listen. Uh, so, Thomas Keating uh, is, was a Trappist monk. Um, he just died uh, end of 2018, well into his 90s when he died. And he was one of the people who started the Centering Prayer Movement, kind of a rediscovery of contemplative prayer in the Christian tradition, uh, kind of reconnection with this mode of silent prayer in the presence of God that, uh, that, that kind of lapsed for hundreds of years, but trying to get it started again. And Keating said that God's first language is silence. The rest is all a bad translation. And that might be a hard thing for us to accept. I mean, we're, you know, we're very word-focused people. You know, we... We like our Bibles, we like our music, we, like, we, we feel like that is a way that we celebrate our faith, that's the way God communicates to us through the Word. But there's something, there's something deep in what Keating said. There's something that's, that's fundamentally true and that's really backed up by the biblical witness. If you look at this story about Elijah, Elijah going into the presence of God. And the thing about this story is it, it has a context. There's other stuff that happened right before this. So Elijah is a prophet in Israel, and Israel has kind of gone in a bad direction. Bad leadership, Jezebel and Ahab, the, the queen and king, are bad people. They're worshiping other gods. They're worshiping Baal, the, the sky god of the Canaanites. And they're doing human sacrifice. All kinds of bad things are happening. And so Elijah gets word from God that there's going to be, there's going to be a reckoning. And so Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal to a contest to see whose God is real. And the way the contest is going to work is they're both going to do a sacrifice. They're going to sacrifice a bull on an altar. And then whichever God sends down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice, that's the real God. Seems like, well, yeah, if fire comes down from heaven, that would that'd probably convince me. So they're thinking that's, that's a reasonable way to go. So prophets of Baal, there's hundreds of them. And they're calling on their God, and they're dancing around, and they're cutting themselves, they're doing all kinds of crazy things, and nothing. There's crickets. And so Elijah starts to have a little fun with them. And he's like, oh, did your God go on vacation? Is he busy? Maybe he's on the potty. It's in there. It's in there. You can read the text. Most of the texts kind of obscure that, but that's what it is. You know, is, your, is, is Baal out relieving himself? And nothing happens. And of course, Elijah says, thank you, God, for hearing me. I know you've heard me. And the fire comes down from heaven, consumes the, consumes the altar, and Elijah is, is vindicated. But Jezebel and Ahab get enraged at him, threaten his life, and so he runs for it. He runs out into the desert. And I think all of us have had this kind of experience where you've done something that's really important. 
you know, you've been really successful. You've had, you accomplished a big project at work, or, you know, maybe back in the day when you were in school, you, you did real well on the SATs, or you had a really great game when you were an athlete. And then later, a week later, two weeks later, it just kind of starts to fade. And you're like, eh, is there really anything? And that's the way Elijah's feeling. He's feeling like he had this, this incredible experience of God's power, and now he's like, does it really matter? Is it really making a difference? Because here I am out in the middle of nowhere, by myself, and where is God? And see, it is in that place where God most powerfully comes to him. It's not in that big display in that battle with the prophets of Baal. Elijah's out there, he goes up on the mountain, and he's waiting for God, and a huge wind comes, wind that's splitting rocks. I mean, double gale force winds. God's not in the wind. There's an earthquake. The very foundations of the world shake and God's not in the earthquake. Then there's a fire. A fire. Where else have we seen a fire recently? But God is not in the fire. Think about that statement. Right after this amazing display of God's power before all of the people to prove that God really is God, and, that, and, and God tells us God's not in the fire. That's not the place to really look for God's presence. And then he hears the sound of sheer silence. And that's when God shows up. That's where God shows up. That's where God touches his life and inspires him to go back down the mountain to do the work that God has called him to do, to call the people back to faith, to invite them back to a relationship with the real loving God. That's, what, that's, that's, that's where he meets him. And I think for, for people in the Bible, that's often the way that it really works. I think we tend, to, we tend to focus on, well, you know, people in the Bible, they have experiences like Elijah calling down fire from heaven, and they have all these supernatural experiences, powerful experiences of God's presence, and that's why they could have faith like they did. That's why they could be sustained, because, well, look at what they, look at the experiences that they had. But ironically, it is not those things that the people in the Bible point to as where they most deeply and powerfully experienced God. Take Paul, for example. You know, Paul, you remember he had that amazing experience on the road to Damascus. He's, he still saw the Pharisee at that point, right? He's breathing threats against the people of God, wants to throw Christians in prison. He's headed off to Damascus. He's on the road, and boom! There's bright light. There's a voice like thunder. He goes blind. He makes it into Damascus and, and one, of the, one of the Christians there prays for him and restores his sight and then he becomes Paul the Apostle, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ all over the world. And you would think, well, there's, there's the experience, right? There's the, there's the thing. And yet... The place that Paul points to as the place where his strength comes from, the place where his contentment comes from, the place where his power comes from, is not, he doesn't point back to the Damascus Road. He's in prison in Rome. He's in prison. And that, in the silence there of that imprisonment, that's where he meets God. And it's in that context where he says those words, I've learned how to be content whether I have a little or whether I have a lot. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That the strength comes in the silence. And I would suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, that it's the same for us. That as we, as we talk over these few weeks about God shaping us, about spiritual formation, about how that happens, about how, how that works its way into our lives, 
that often it is not in the dramatic. It's not in those, those experiences of glory and power. I mean, and those are great things. Those are great things. Don't get me wrong. If you have an experience like that, you know, if, you, if, you, you know, if you've like been to the ELCA youth gathering with 20,000 people singing someplace, that's pretty powerful, right, Hayden? I mean, Karen, Brian, I know it's long, long ago for you to remember that far, but, <laughs> you know, it, it's, those are, those are, those are touching things. But the kind of daily, quiet encounter, that is the thing that sustains us over the long haul. That's the thing that reminds us that we're never alone. That's the thing that enables us to say with Paul, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Thanks be to God.